Hi, it's Katrina. Ball pythons. The ball python, also called the royal python, is native to West and Central Africa. This widely distributed snake is a constrictor and is the smallest of the African pythons, reaching a maximum length of six feet, which is still pretty darn big. The ball python gets its name from its tendency to curl into a ball and hide its head when it's stressed or scared. Despite the species' somewhat timid and evasive nature, it's probably still easy to think that one could easily squeeze an average human to death. This isn't the case, however. Ball pythons are widely favored as pets, partially because they aren't typically big or strong enough to constrict an adult human, and the risk of injury from one is very minimal. They are among the most popular kinds of pet snakes because they are quite calm and docile. But of course, going near a ball python in the wild and or owning one as a pet do come with some risks. For instance, while a specimen can't technically constrict a person to death, it is possible for one of these snakes to harm a human, especially a young child. And while a bite is unlikely to cause serious injury, the experience can still be traumatizing, painful, and expensive. For these reasons, ball pythons are best left to educated and responsible pet owners. In other words, do your research and do your part to reduce the amount of snakes poached from the wild. Know what you're getting yourself into and be committed to providing the animal with top-notch care and respect its need for space. That pretty much goes for any pet. It's also a good idea to get a ball python when they're young so that you can properly train and socialize them. Western Hognose Snake the western hognose snake is endemic to North America, occurring from southern Canada throughout the United States and down to northern Mexico. Though mildly venomous, this stout-bodied snake is harmless to humans. Its appearance varies depending on subspecies, with many western hognose snakes resembling rattlesnakes in color and pattern. They are also called blow snakes, bluffer, faux viper, etc. because they pretend to be a dangerous, scary snake without biting, if possible. If it feels threatened, it will lie perfectly still, but if it can't avoid a predator, it will throw a hissy fit. It will puff its neck like a cobra and hiss very loudly. It will become hostile if necessary and take a couple of mock strikes, but not really. This snake is very dramatic. If that still doesn't work, it will pretend to drop dead and emit a foul odor and will stay limp even if you pick it up. Usually nobody wants to eat a rotting carcass, right? But one of these rear fanged specimens certainly can't and won't do the same damage as a rattlesnake, say. While its venom is mostly harmful to toads, its preferred food source, it's extremely rare for the western hognose to bite people. In fact, there are no recorded deaths or allergic reactions from hognose bites, and experts consider them medically inconsequential to humans. It's naturally very docile, and it's highly unlikely for one to attack a person in the first place. Rosy Boa Rosy boas are slow-moving, thick-bodied nocturnal snakes found in deserts, scrublands, and rocky mountainsides throughout the American Southwest and parts of Mexico, including the state of Baja California. During the day, they take refuge underneath rocks, and they spend their evenings and nights out hunting for prey. Young specimens eat mice and small snakes, graduating to larger food sources as they progress toward adulthood. And rosy boas in general are voracious eaters with eager appetites. Females are larger than males, with the species ranging in length from 2 to 4 feet. These snakes have one of the longest lifespans of all boas. They live over 20 years on average, with many surviving into their 30s. Rosy boas are not the friendliest looking creatures, but they are a popular pet, known for their ease of handling and good temperament. When one gets aggressive, it's usually due to lack of food rather than its natural demeanor. Or something might be wrong with it. But even the most docile animals have a limit and will act defensively when they feel threatened or overhandled. So to avoid triggering an unwanted response, pet guardians are urged to limit handling time and to avoid holding their snake too tightly or limiting its movement. It can get annoyed. Green Tree Python First described in 1872 by German herpetologist Hermann Schlegel, the vividly hued green tree python is native to New Guinea, parts of Indonesia, and Australia's Cape York Peninsula where it lives primarily in trees and hunts small mammals and reptiles. It grows up to 6.6 .6 feet long and typically weighs around 3.5 pounds, with exceptionally large specimens tipping the scales at up to 5 pounds. The species certainly carries an intimidating look based on its alarmingly bright color and long body, and it's also easily agitated and known to bite when provoked. They have a reputation for being aggressive, which is probably good for them. Males are especially likely to become aggressive during mating season while searching for a mate, and females are most inclined to act hostile when they have eggs to protect. But the green tree python is non-venomous, 
and while experts strongly recommend seeking medical treatment for bites and avoiding one in the first place, these snakes do not typically cause serious damage. These guys are not great for beginners, but some people describe their pythons as puppy dog friendly, super tame, and as sweethearts, as long as you don't catch them by surprise. However, they are very delicate and should be handled with care as they can be easily injured. They also have very specific needs if you are going to keep one as a pet, so be careful or they can die. This species has more reasons to fear us than the other way around. Despite its label of least concern on the International Union for Conservation of Nature red list, the species' numbers are potentially threatened due to its popularity as a pet, which has resulted in rampant smuggling of wild-caught specimens, especially in Indonesia. Garter Snake Garter snakes, which are often mistakenly referred to as garden snakes due to the similarity between the names, are one of the most common snakes throughout North America, with around 30 species being found from Canada all the way down to Florida. They are most easily identified by a line along their spine, and most have three longitudinal strips, a center one along their spine and one on each lower side of their body. Generally speaking, garter snakes are relatively small, ranging in length from 23 to 30 inches, but some species grow up to 5 feet long. It might be pretty scary to encounter one of these surprisingly common snakes, regardless of its size, especially if you're not expecting it and one comes slithering out of nowhere. But garter snakes are non-venomous, and in most cases completely harmless to humans. When provoked, they may defend themselves by striking, just like any animal that feels cornered, but it's practically unheard of for this to result in serious injury. At worst, a bite victim can probably expect a scratch and some light bleeding. You can easily avoid a bite simply by not going near a garter snake and by giving one its space if you unintentionally get too close. Boa Constrictor Boa constrictors are known for their size and thickness, with those on the larger end of the spectrum reaching up to 13 feet long and weighing as much as 60 pounds. In the wild, they are found in various habitats in tropical North, Central, and South America as well as parts of the Caribbean. These heavy-bodied, semi-aquatic solitary snakes are also popular as pets and are commonly kept and bred in captivity. Many people even allow boa constrictors to freely move about their home. I'm by no means saying that you should, I'm just saying that people do. Some people even have these snakes as emotional support animals. Of course, there are dangers to coming within close proximity of one, including the species' propensity for aggression and its ability to tightly coil around someone potentially cutting off their air supply and suffocating them, or if you have a child around or other pets. They're even more likely to become aggressive while molting, due to a substance secreted from their eyes which obstructs their vision and interferes with their other senses. On the other hand, boa constrictors do not bite very often, although it's not out of the realm of possibility, especially if one gets spooked, but the good news is that they are non-venomous. Bites are typically not life-threatening, but victims are still urged to seek medical attention to avoid an infection, which could cause serious internal damage. The moral of the story? Use common sense when it comes to keeping a boa constrictor as a pet, and try not to encounter one in the wild unless you know what you're doing. Corn Snakes As you've probably noticed by now, some snakes have passive demeanors while others might be aggressive but aren't dangerous. The corn snake is actually beneficial to humans, in addition to simply being harmless. A North American species, the corn snake is often recommended as a pet. Found throughout the central and southeastern U.S., this moderately sized snake kills its prey, usually rodents, by constriction. Outwardly, the corn snake somewhat resembles the venomous copperhead, sometimes unintentionally misleading people who will freak out and kill it. This is unfortunate because corn snakes, which are frequently sighted near grain stores, feed on mice and rats thereby preventing the rodents from eating harvested crops. They act as natural pest control and, hey, it's cheaper than an exterminator. Besides being beneficial to farmers, corn snakes are non-venomous, reluctant to bite, and naturally docile, perhaps making them the most desirable snake for beginners. California King Snake The California King Snake is endemic to the western United States and northern Mexico, where it occurs in a variety of habitats, including woodland, grassland, deserts, marshes, high altitudes of up to 7,000 feet, and in the suburbs. These relatively small snakes, which rarely exceed 4 feet long, are active during the day but become nocturnal in hot weather and retreat into a hibernation-like state called brumation, which is where growth, development, and physical activity are temporarily halted. When they are not in brumation, they are active hunters and opportunistic feeders who kill rodents, birds, other reptiles, and amphibians via constriction. In other words, as you know, squeezing them to death. In fact, the California king snake has one of the strongest squeezes in ratio to its body size out of all snakes. 
This may be an evolutionary adaptation to its tendency to kill reptiles, who need less oxygen than mammals and therefore are more difficult to suffocate to death. They respond to disturbances and threats by coiling their bodies and hiding their heads, hissing and rattling their tails, which makes a sound similar to a rattlesnake. California king snakes are completely non-venomous, and they are prone to anxiety, but are typically more docile than most other snakes their size, and only tend to become aggressive when agitated, making them ideal pets. And when raised in captivity, they usually turn out very calm. Milk snakes Found throughout North and South America, milk snakes are a king snake species, which bear a somewhat striking resemblance to venomous copperhead and coral snakes and are often mistaken for them due to their bright, blotchy coloration. Altogether, there are 24 recognized milk snake subspecies, ranging in length from 14 to 69 inches, and some scientists believe some actually constitute their own species. Milk snakes are well known for their use of mimicry as a defensive strategy, herpetologist Bill Hayborn told Life Science, also noting that they evolved specifically for this purpose. This type of mimicry, where a harmless species mimics a harmful species, is known as Batesian mimicry. Milk snakes are not only harmless to humans, they are known for being easy to handle. For this reason, they are popularly bred and kept in captivity. At the same time, while their Batesian mimicry has helped them in the wild, it has caused problems for them with people who kill them thinking that they're dangerous. To avoid this potentially fatal mistake, people can pay attention to the shapes of a snake's blotches, according to the Savannah River Ecology Laboratory. Copperhead's blotches boast a distinct hourglass shape, while milk snakes are covered in thick, rounded markings. But milk snakes can look eerily similar to some dangerous coral snake species when it comes to these blotches. They also sometimes shake their tail, imitating a rattlesnake when in danger, throwing further confusion into the mix. Many subspecies of milk snakes overlap the venomous coral snake in range, Hayborn explained. Coral snakes also have alternating bands of color, but the patterning differs between the two snakes. Coral snakes have red and yellow bands next to one another, while the harmless milk snake has red and black bands next to each other. In areas of the world where both species exist, there are a variety of rhymes, which have been used to help people distinguish the two. For example, red on yellow kills a fellow, red on black, friend of Jack. I mean, there are so many variations of this saying, but in any case, now you know. Water snakes. As their namesake implies, water snakes like to spend their time in and around water. Found throughout North America, they are often confused with water moccasin snakes, also called cottonmouths, who look and behave similarly but are venomous. Much like how milk snakes often resemble coral or copperhead snakes, water snakes have what's called Batesian mimicry. Unlike the water moccasin snake, who carries a dangerous bite, water snakes are non-venomous, and the two hail from entirely different families. Unfortunately, their similarity leads to many non-threatening water snakes being killed by humans. The similarity may be an evolutionary adaptation of the water snakes to avoid predation, said Bill Hayborn, the same herpetologist who spoke with Live Science about the Batesian mimicry of milk snakes. To tell water snakes apart from cottonmouths or water moccasins, a person should pay attention to a specimen's head and neck. Water moccasins tend to have blocky, heavy heads and thick, stocky bodies for their length, Hayborn told Live Science. They also tend to have a more distinct neck. Harmless water snakes, on the other hand, have a narrower, rounder head, a longer, more slender body, and a less distinctive neck. Moreover, water snakes lack heat-sensitive pits on their faces, which water moccasins do have, but above all, people are simply urged to use common sense. In Hayborn's words, if you are unsure, it is best to leave snakes alone and not risk getting them confused. Some might be friendly, some might not be. Wise words. Water snakes are otherwise pretty chill and can be friendly if they feel like it. Valley of the Golden Mummies Just south of Cairo, there is an archaeological site known as Bawit. In 1994, it earned its stripes as one of the most astonishing archaeological landmarks in Egyptian history. Researchers discovered a two-square-mile necropolis that is home to a large number of tombs. The story goes that a man was chasing after his donkey when the donkey's leg fell through a hole in the ground. In the hole was gold. The man called the authorities, who brought in archaeologists. When they first looked inside, they found 105 mummies, some with ornate masks of gold, earning the site its name, the Valley of the Golden Mummies. Dating back to 332 BC, this necropolis has given us a wealth of information about life during this time. Among the 105 mummies found originally, there were a wide variety of burial types. Some had gold masks and chest plates, while others displayed more modest burial techniques involving terracotta and linen. 
This implies that there are many different kinds of people buried in the valley, representing a wide array of social classes among the dead. Unfortunately, there were no inscriptions found anywhere, so it has been hard to tell who the mummies were. Since then, researchers have predicted that this is nowhere near the end of the story for the valley. Since their original excavation, archaeologists have uncovered hundreds more, each with their own distinctive method of preservation and burial. They estimate that there may be closer to 10,000 mummies in the necropolis. Communal Tombs for Priests In the Tuna El Gabal site of Minya, archaeologists recently discovered one of the first Egyptian archaeological discoveries of 2020, a communal tomb that was intended for high priests, the head of the religious caste in ancient Egypt. This necropolis is called Kumun, and it was dedicated to the god Jehuti, or Toth, who represented knowledge, magic, writing, and the moon for ancient Egyptians. The temple priests were very important for the Egyptian culture. They would shave their entire body because it meant having a pure body for the gods. They were the only people who could open the temple's doors and touch the gods' golden sculptures. They burned perfume and incense to make divine the temples, and they used to leave food in front of the golden sculptures as an offering to the god who reigned over the temple. So far, archaeologists have found around 16 tombs, including 20 coffins, that differ in style dramatically. Five are limestone with engraved hieroglyphic texts, depicting stories of different gods, including Osiris and Epi. Others were made of wood, and some were decorated with the titles and names of their owners. They've also found upwards of 10,000 Ushabti figurines, about 5 to 30 centimeters long, engraved with the titles of the deceased, symbolizing the dead. This is yet another discovery in a long line of recent ones in Minya, including mummies, jewelry, and other sacred figurines, making Minya one of the most sought-after archaeological sites in the contemporary world. Hatshepsut's Mummy The Valley of the Kings is where archaeologist Howard Carter discovered King Tut's tomb in 1920. But before that, in 1903, he had found a tomb and opened it. Inside were mummified geese and partially disturbed remains of two women laying side by side. The tomb was not royal, so the mummies were put away and stored for many years. Thanks to the Discovery Channel and their $5 million DNA project funding, they determined that one of the neglected mummies was the most powerful female ruler of Egypt, Pharaoh Hatshepsut. Egypt's foremost archaeologist, Zahi Hawass, said that this is the most important discovery in the Valley of the Kings since the discovery of King Tutankhamun and one of the greatest adventures of my life. Hatshepsut reigned during the 18th dynasty and was one of the most controversial pharaohs of all time. She disturbed some essential Egyptian beliefs. For example, the role of pharaoh was known as the living embodiment of the male god Horus, and disturbing the tradition of rule by men was a big challenge for all the Egyptian traditions. However, she tried to adapt to these patriarchal beliefs. She took the name of Mat Kare and sometimes referred to herself as Hatshepsut, adding a su, the masculine word, at the end of her name. She often wore men's clothing and a false beard. Under her rule, the Egyptian empire expanded. Upon her death, she was mysteriously erased from history, most likely by her son, who took over the throne. When Zahi Hawass reinvestigated the tomb for the upcoming Discovery Network special, they determined the mummy to belong to a large woman between 45 to 60 years old. Notably, her teeth were in very bad shape. They used a CT scan to look inside a box associated with the queen where they found a tooth. Incredibly, the size of the tooth matched the mummified remains. This helped to confirm that the unidentified mummy was in fact the pharaoh. She died under very mysterious circumstances. Temple of Bastet Cats are some of the most beloved creatures on Earth. But as much as you love cats, it's a safe bet that Egyptians loved them even more. Archaeologists recently discovered a temple devoted entirely to the cat deity Bastet in the Kam el Deka region of Alexandria. It is a remnant of the Ptolemaic dynasty in Egypt, which ruled in the area 305 to 30 BC, until Octavian defeated Cleopatra, the last member of the Ptolemaic dynasty. Researchers think that the temple belonged to Queen Berenike II, who was married to Ptolemy III. Bastet was originally worshipped as a feline with the head of a lion, a relative of the great sun god Ra. But the Hellenistic Egyptians thought of Bastet pretty much the way they thought of the Greek god Artemis. It is the first royal spot in the area discovered to date. The temple is also home to various statues and pieces of pottery. Given that Alexandria sits atop these ancient ruins, there is, without a doubt, much left to be discovered in the area. Valley of the Kings The Valley of the Kings is one of the most famous cemeteries in all of Egypt, containing King Tut's coffin and a number of other members of ancient royalty. In 2019, the Valley of the Kings became even more interesting. 
Archaeologists uncovered the mummified remains of two women next to the resting place of Hatshepsut, the formidable pharaoh. Those are not the only things that archaeologists uncovered there. In addition, they found a kind of workshop where laborers made things to construct tombs, a few workshops for pottery and furniture, and a room that was clearly meant as a mummification area. They also found a large piece of wood about three feet long that looks like a two-pronged fork, inscribed with hieroglyphs which translate to Lord of the Two Lands. Archaeologists think that this tool might have been something like a forklift to hold furniture to put it inside the tomb. Additional inscriptions found on pottery at the site tell the tale of the workers who devoted their lives to the Valley of the Kings. Researchers hope to reconstruct the lives of those who helped us build the artifacts that amaze us to this day, because these recent discoveries help to tell their stories with accuracy and care. Black Sarcophagus There is yet another recent Alexandrian discovery that had the archaeological world rubbing its hands together in anticipation. In 2018, archaeologists in the city Gaber area of Alexandria discovered a granite sarcophagus that is entirely black. If you're digging around in ancient Egyptian territory for long enough, you're likely to find a coffin or two. But what's interesting about this sarcophagus is that this one hasn't been cracked open for around 2,000 years, an unlikely occurrence given the prevalence of tomb looting for years. They know this because there was a thick coating of mortar between the top and the remainder of the burial chamber. Upon this discovery of the black sarcophagus, stories began circulating that the tomb was cursed. It was found when local authorities were doing the standard archaeological excavations before construction begins on new projects. About 16 feet below the ground, they found the coffin along with an alabaster bust of a man. It is said to be the largest sarcophagus ever found in Alexandria. Despite the possible curse, officials finally opened the coffin to discover three skeletons and red-brown sewage water. No one knows who these people are, and it's too soon to tell. But given these recent Alexandrian discoveries, along with our improving technology, it must surely be an exciting time to be an Egyptologist. World's Oldest Cheese Cheese lovers of the world, unite! Cheese is one thing that can bring us all together. And if you're of an adventurous nature, maybe you'd be interested in trying some aged cheese. But this cheese is probably a little too aged for even your liking. This 3,200-year-old wheel of cheese was found in Mayor Thomas' tomb, but in 2018 it was discovered that it is full of bacteria that can cause the potentially fatal disease brucellosis, caused by unpasteurized dairy. But who was Potamus? He was the mayor of Memphis, Egypt in the 13th century BC. His tomb was actually uncovered a while back in 1885, but until 2010 it had disappeared into the misty sands of the desert. Inside his tomb was a large jar of solidified gunk that was determined to be cheese, probably made from cow, sheep, and goat's milk. It is possible that ancient people may have used cheese as medicine. Until now, though, there was no proof of whether or not it was part of the daily life of ancient Egyptians, and researchers aren't quite sure what it would have tasted like. Regardless, this makes this sample the world's oldest cheese and the world's oldest reported biomolecular evidence of brucellosis. Tomb of Kui In Saqqara, Egypt, archaeologists recently discovered the mummy of Kui, a highly decorated official under the reign of Pharaoh Jedkar Isesi. This means that Kui's remains are 4,400 years old, but it appears that time has not done a great deal of damage. However, there was another tomb found nearby which had been ransacked long ago, making this tomb a lucky find for archaeologists. Kui's tomb is decorated with intricate hieroglyphs and pictures still decipherable today. These hieroglyphs are what enabled experts to discern the nature of this tomb and Kui's role in the pharaoh's administration. For example, they discovered some of his titles such as Overseer of the Kentui Shi of the Great House and Great One of the Ten of Upper Egypt. Clearly, Kui was pretty high up. The design of Kui's tomb has a lot to owe to the pyramids. In order to enter the tomb, one must descend down a corridor into a hallway which leads to an antechamber. In that room, there is a depiction of him sitting before an offering table and two spots that lead into his resting place. This floor plan is remarkably similar to the kind constructed beneath the pyramids in Egypt's fifth dynasty. Given its intricacy and informativeness, Kui's tomb is sure to be a hub of interesting information for years to come. Cachette of the Priests Archaeologists were rightly stunned by what they found at El Asasif, an ancient necropolis near Luxor, Egypt. They found the mummified remains of 30 people locked inside of tightly closed coffins, estimated to be around 3,000 years old. It was denominated a cachette, which means a place where things were hidden away. The coffins were arranged in two layers. This discovery is now referred to as the Cachette of the Priests, 
as some of these bodies belong to those among the priestly class of ancient Egyptian society. They were preserved with incredible care. When the coffins were opened at a press conference, onlookers were stunned to see their wrapping completely untouched. There are 23 men, 5 women, and 2 children in these sarcophagi. And the bodies aren't the only astounding thing about these tombs. Each coffin bears detailed paintings depicting some of the famous Egyptian deities. Experts are still trying to translate the hieroglyphics and analyze the drawings on the coffins. Hopefully this will make it clearer who these people were, why they were buried in the cachette, and what their lives were like. Pyramid Mystery Recently, archaeologists discovered something strange beside a 4,600-year-old pyramid. The ancient remains of a 13-year-old girl in a squatting position inside of her otherwise empty tomb. No one knows when she was buried, but they found out about her age by looking at her skeleton. There were also animal heads, probably from bulls, and tiny ceramics in the makeshift cemetery. However, these may not have been placed there for the girl at all. Archaeologists aren't sure whose funeral they were meant for. Called the Maidum Pyramid, it was initially a step pyramid before it was converted into a true pyramid with smooth surfaces. Its entrance is on the north face of the pyramid above ground level, which takes you to a vertical shaft that leads down to the burial chamber. There is no sarcophagus and no evidence of a burial, so it is likely that this pyramid was used as an experiment. Ancient Emperor Snefru guided the construction of many pyramids and gave the Maidum Pyramid a significant remodeling, upgrading it from a step pyramid to a smooth one. No one is quite certain when or why he felt the need to construct so many pyramids, but it might be that he was trying to figure out the best way to make them. His trial and error must have worked, since he passed that knowledge down to his son Khufu, who built the Great Pyramid of Giza. Because of this discovery, the nature of the Maidum Pyramid and Snefru's intentions with it are mysterious. Why the cemetery next door? Probably some part of Maidum was built for Snefru in particular, and he changed it later. In any case, his influence on the pyramids is undeniable, even if we are still unsure about his plans. The Blue Whale You may already know that the blue whale is the largest animal that ever lived. I know, some people don't believe me, but it's the truth. And we should be honored to live at the same time as the biggest animal that has ever lived. Understanding the true size of these beautiful creatures is difficult, and even if you're lucky enough to see one breaching the water's surface, you won't see their entire body at once. These gentle giants range between 82 and 105 feet long and can weigh more than 200 tons, according to National Geographic. The longest blue whale ever recorded was 111 feet long, roughly the equivalent of three school buses parked end to end. A blue whale's tongue can weigh as much as an adult elephant, and it has the biggest heart of any animal, weighing up to 1,300 pounds, about the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. Calves are already around 27 feet long and weigh as much as a hippopotamus when they're born. A baby blue whale drinks up to 100 gallons of milk and gains as much as 200 pounds a day. Antonov and 225 Maria At 275 feet long and with a wingspan of 290 feet, the Antonov An-225 Maria is the world's largest operational cargo aircraft. Originally designed as a Soviet rocket carrier, it's also the longest-bodied, longest-winged, and heaviest operational plane in the world, according to Aerotime Hub. To put its size into perspective, both the plane's wingspan and length are nearly the equivalent of the length of a football field. Without cargo or fuel, the An-225 weighs around 193 tons. Its gigantic cargo hold is big enough to fit 50 cars, and the plane can even carry oversized items on top of its fuselage. To accommodate its massive size and weight, the landing gear consists of 32 wheels, and a specially designed retractable nose gear system enables the plane to kneel so that cargo can be driven into the fuselage where there's an onboard crane that can lift over 60,000 pounds at a time. Its six turbofan engines are capable of putting out enormous thrust, enabling the An-225 to take off with a maximum payload of 275 tons. There is only one in operation which first flew in 1988 and entered into cargo service in 2001. Earlier this year, it made headlines for carrying 100 tons of medical supplies for combating the COVID-19 pandemic from China to Warsaw, Poland. It was the largest cargo shipment by volume, filling around 80% of the plane's cargo hold. Coconut Crab Also called the robber crab or the palm thief, 
The coconut crab is the world's largest terrestrial arthropod, weighing up to 9 pounds and measuring as long as 3 feet from one leg tip to another. It's about the size of a puppy or a full-grown dog, depending on the breed. Native to the Indian and Southern Pacific Oceans, these humongous creatures even wowed Charles Darwin. Scientists are trying to better understand the species, which is related to hermit crabs, porcelain crabs, and squat lobsters, as its numbers dwindle. While studying coconut crabs in the Chagos Archipelago, Mark Ladra, a National Geographic explorer and assistant professor of biological sciences at Dartmouth College, discovered that they can generate up to 1,500 newtons of force with their grip, more than any other member of the animal kingdom, while opening their favorite food, coconuts. He also witnessed coconut crabs feasting on hermit crabs, rats, and even live birds. Kind of creepy, right? The Mona Lisa Leonardo da Vinci's Mona Lisa, also called La Gioconda, is one of the most iconic paintings of all time. Just a refresher, it is most likely a portrait of a noblewoman dressed in Florentine clothing in front of a mountainous landscape, but she is most famous for her enigmatic and mysterious grin. You can probably easily envision the painting without having to look it up, which speaks to its worldwide historical fame. But did you know that this larger-than-life painting, with all of its symbolism and history, is actually kind of small? Didn't you expect it to be big, like poster size? The masterpiece was unfinished when da Vinci passed away in 1519, leaving the remainder of the work to one of his assistants. There are various theories regarding who the woman in the portrait is. Many experts believe that an adoring husband named Francesco del Giocondo commissioned the painting of his wife, Lisa Gerardini, in 1503. Others believe that the Mona Lisa is a female portrait of da Vinci himself. And there are many other theories in between. The artwork has its very own room at the Louvre Museum in Paris, where it sits behind a shatterproof glass window in a controlled temperature chamber, which is kept at 43 degrees Fahrenheit, and underneath a glass ceiling designed to let natural light flow in, offering an optimal view of the painting. Fun fact, it was actually stolen in 1911 and has been attacked numerous times. Thanks to this bulletproof case, it is still in remarkably good condition, even though people have thrown rocks, mugs, and spray paint at it. Despite the Mona Lisa's long-lasting prominence in the world of art history and its exclusive display within the Louvre, I'm telling you, it's surprisingly small, measuring just 30 inches high and 21 inches wide, and weighing roughly 18 pounds. That's less than the size of a yardstick, or 3 feet tall and 3 inches shy of 2 feet wide, smaller than an average television set. Seeing the painting within its dedicated exhibit conveys just how surprisingly modest its dimensions are. Patago Titan Mayorum Based on fossil evidence, Patago Titan Mayorum is thought by some to be the largest dinosaur that ever existed. It was around 122 feet long and stood 20 feet high at the shoulder. At 76 tons, this beast was as heavy as a space shuttle, about 10,000 times heavier than a bowling ball, and dwarfed the Tyrannosaurus Rex. It was about 11 times heavier. Diego Pohl, co-author of a 2017 study of the dinosaur size, said it was like putting an elephant next to a lion. Patago Titan Mayorum fossils dating back 100 million years were discovered on a ranch in southern Argentina in 2012. The species was from a collection of four-legged herbivores with long necks and tails called sauropods, who were the biggest dinosaurs of all time. The ancient gargantuan was also a titanosaur, a subgroup of the largest sauropods. Researchers are still figuring out why these dinosaurs got so big. One theory is that a sudden burst of flowering plants and vegetation provided ample food, causing them to grow. Given the size of their bones, this titanosaurian sauropod was comparable to other giant titanosaurs. However, the Patago titan bones found were much larger than those of another large creature, the Argentinosaurus. It was about 11 times as heavy as an elephant and is a contender for the biggest animal to ever walk the earth. CSCL Globe When the container ship CSCL Globe debuted in 2014, it was the world's largest cargo vessel at over 1,312 feet long, the equivalent of eight Olympic-sized swimming pools, over four football fields, or 36 London double-decker buses lined up bumper to bumper. The ship is 186 feet wide and 240 feet high, with a carrying capacity of 19,100 containers. Enough space for 300 million laptops, 156 million pairs of shoes, or 900 million cans of baked beans, according to the BBC. Laid end-to-end, -end, the maximum containers the vessel can hold would stretch for 72 miles. 
Another way to measure the CSCL globe's cargo carrying capacity is by gross tonnage, which is 187,541 tons. Not quite as much as the Antonov Maria cargo plane, but still impressive in its own right, especially when you get a chance to witness how the vessel dwarves other ships. Its engine alone is one of the largest ever constructed, standing at 56 feet high, or around five stories. The CSCL globe is so big, in fact, it's too tall to dock at any U.S. ports, and it's too wide to traverse the Panama Canal. But it only spent around a month as the world's biggest cargo ship in operation before it was superseded by the Oscar, which can carry 224 more containers. Giant Isopod The Bathynomus genus contains around nine species of large bottom-dwelling crustaceans called giant isopods, with B. giganteus being the biggest among them. They typically reach between 7.5 and 14 inches long, but it can grow even bigger. In 2010, for example, a remotely operated vehicle was pulled from the water with a 2.5 foot long giant isopod attached. Scientists are unsure why giant isopods get so big, but they believe their size may be an evolutionary adaptation that has something to do with surviving the immense pressures at the bottom of the ocean, where these creatures live at depths beyond 1,640 feet. This is called deep sea gigantism, which is when deep sea dwellers grow larger than their shallow water relatives. In the case of the giant isopod, this may result from cooler water temperatures and therefore longer lifespans. They might just go on growing forever if they get the chance. Curiosity Rover NASA's Mars Science Laboratory's Curiosity Rover is a vehicle designed for exploring the Red Planet, where it touched down for the first time on August 6, 2012, after a 350 million mile journey. Its jobs are to investigate the climate and geology on Mars, detect any conditions that were possibly once favorable for microbial life, including evidence of water, and explore future prospects of planetary habitability. I don't know if I want to live on Mars, do you? At first glance, Curiosity looks relatively small, perhaps the size of the toy cars and jeeps that children ride around in. But in reality, it's closer to the size of an actual vehicle. At about 10 feet long, 9 feet wide, and 7 feet tall, it's roughly the equivalent of a small SUV. At around 2,000 pounds, it weighs about the same as well. It also has six 20-inch wheels, which are designed to roll over obstacles measuring up to 25 inches high, or a little over 2 feet, and to travel about 660 feet daily. So, while the Curiosity certainly compares in size to an SUV, it doesn't go nearly as fast as one, and it's arguably more capable of traversing rough terrain. The rover has been on Mars for upwards of 2,766 souls, or Mars days. In late 2019, it discovered evidence that the Martian Gale Crater may have once contained saltwater ponds and streams, which periodically overflowed and dried up over millions of years. The Blanket Octopus The term sexual dimorphism refers to the difference in size between males and females in the animal kingdom. One of the most striking examples of this difference is seen in the blanket octopus, with females reaching up to 6 feet long and weighing as much as 40,000 times more than their male counterparts. Males are about the size of a walnut, measuring less than an inch long, so small that, according to biologist Tom Traganza, one specimen could fit inside a female's pupil. A male blanket octopus was only observed for the first time in 2002. Perhaps researchers were looking for a bigger creature given the female's size. There are four species of blanket octopus, and mating literally happens at an arm's length, with the male detaching his sperm-holding arm, called a hectocotylus, and giving it to the female, you're welcome, who stores it in her mantle for a rainy day when she wants to reproduce. Scientists can only speculate thus far regarding why male and female blanket octopuses differ so greatly from one another in size. One theory is that males put all their energy into finding mates, rather than growing. Blanket octopuses are also unique in their immunity to the highly potent venom of the Portuguese man-o-war, which is highly venomous to humans. Females are even known to yank the creature's tentacles and wield them as her weapon against other creatures and divers that get too close. When threatened, female blanket octopuses outstretch their arms, creating the blanket-like effect they're named after, which is intended to scare away predators. Is it working? Are they scary? A million versus a billion dollars Even most of the richest people on Earth have probably never had a million dollars or more in cash laid out in front of them at any given time. 
given the tendency for people nowadays to keep their money in the bank and handle transactions electronically. And suppose someone did have that much cash stored at their house, they would probably store it in the form of $100 bills. But what would a million or even a billion dollars look like in stacks of single dollar bills? I mean, Pablo Escobar may be new, but the rest of us? According to the Endowment for Human Development, a stack of one million one dollar bills would measure 4,300 inches or 358 feet high, roughly the size of a 30 to 35 story building. A $100 million stack would add up to 35,851 feet, or 6.79 miles. This is about the same altitude that commercial airliners fly at. $1 billion would reach 67.9 miles into the sky, where space begins at an altitude of 62 miles. This means that well-known billionaires like Amazon founder Jeff Bezos, who's worth around $145 billion, and Bill Gates, who's worth nearly $107 billion, have enough money to reach well into the realm of space. Meanwhile, most Americans don't even make the $100,000 it would take for their annual salary to measure 43 inches, or less than four feet high as a single stack of dollar bills. Tiger Beach, Bahamas. Tiger Beach in the Bahamas is an idyllic place, but don't expect to find big cats there. Instead, the shallow sand flat an hour from the West Grand Bahama Island is home to a large number of tiger sharks. Ranked among the top 10 most shark-infested beaches in the world, Tiger Beach is the most popular of several diving sites in Grand Bahama, with a high concentration of not only tiger sharks, but also hammerheads, black tips, and bull sharks, divers are in for a real treat when they travel to the area. It's definitely on my bucket list. Many female sharks tend to go there to give birth in safety, resulting in a dramatic rise in the number of sharks in the area. Getting their name from the dark vertical stripes found on juveniles, tiger sharks lose their stripes as they mature. They are some of the largest predatory fish in tropical seas, and tiger sharks have an intimidating presence and are known to have a reputation for eating people. However, they tend to avoid biting humans and instead frequently swim the other way. In 2019, there were two reported shark attacks in the Bahamas, one of which was fatal. Jordan Lindsay was snorkeling with her family when she was attacked, but in the Bahamas, it is extremely rare. As a scavenger, tiger sharks tend to eat stingrays, sea snakes, seals, birds, and squids. After spending five to six months in the open Atlantic Ocean, they migrate south to the Bahamas where they spend the autumn and winter months. Most of the tiger sharks observed are females, many of them pregnant, leading researchers to believe that their months in the open ocean are used to mate and feed on migratory loggerhead turtles. One of the first countries to establish a marine protected area, the Bahamas is also the first country in the wider Caribbean area to prohibit all fishing in the Exuma Cays. With 26 national parks and over 1 million acres of protected land and sea, the Bahamas established a shark sanctuary in 2011, formally protecting the animals in the Bahamian waters by law. Divers are allowed to take part in open water encounters with tiger sharks. Cage-free shark diving is a major draw for those who want to hand feed large sharks, but you can never be too careful. Have you ever done this before? Would you hand feed a shark? Let me know in the comments below. South Africa's Shark Alley. The highest concentration of great white sharks in the world is an area known as Shark Alley. It is one of the top commercial shark cage diving destinations located off the coast of a small town called Gansby at the southeast coast of South Africa. Home to over 50,000 Cape fur seals, the channel attracts thousands of great white sharks to hunt the animals. From May to August, Shark Alley is busy with the birth of young seal pups, attracting not only great whites, but cage divers looking for sightings of sharks breaching the water to ambush seals. Shark Alley is famous for its jumping sharks. Great white sharks here have learned to jump literally out of the water to capture seals. Research vessels will often use decoy seals deployed from the boats to observe this behavior, discovering that shark attacks were successful between 40 to 55% of the time. If you want to see this for yourself from a safe distance, be sure to check out the show Planet Earth. Dyer Island used to house a large colony of African penguins, but the 25,000 pairs have now dwindled to only about 900. Unfortunately, human interference has caused the penguins to move on, although other birds, including cormorants, gulls, and terns, roost there in the winter. Infamous for not just the great whites, the coastline is also home to many seals, as well as dolphins and whales that flourish in the waters. There is no doubt that wherever you look, you are going to have a show. Isla Mujeres 
An amazing phenomenon happens every summer at the northeast of Isla Mujeres, 13 kilometers off the coast of Cancun, where the largest known gathering of whale sharks takes place, a great event that any visitor wouldn't want to miss. Whale sharks are the biggest sharks in the world, measuring up to 60 feet long. Although they are mostly known for roaming the open oceans, whale sharks tend to congregate in the area when there are high seasonal concentrations of plankton. The first official surveys done in 2006 revealed a total of 480 sightings of whale sharks in the area, with the most occurring for a few weeks from late July to the middle of August. Their congregation coincided with the seasonally spawning crustaceans as well as the presence of large quantities of fish eggs in the water. It's like an all-you-can-eat buffet! While some people enjoy the hustle and bustle of Cancun and its tourist trappings, those looking for a more rustic, laid-back excursion should look into Isla Mujeres for beautiful beaches, unspoiled land, and sightings of a whale shark or two. What do you think? Would you like to see one? Let me know in the comments below! 7 Gill Sharks in 2017, great white sharks started disappearing off the coast of South Africa, and researchers were understandably concerned. At the same time, they noticed that when the great whites began to vanish from the area, another species of shark, the seven-gill, began to show up for the first time. Since then, the numbers have continued to increase. A threatened species, seven gills are protected because they aren't regularly seen. They are hunted for food and sport in a number of countries, which has contributed to their decline in other areas. In 2017 and 2018, when great white numbers were at an all-time low around Seal Island, researchers wondered why. Seven gills, which normally congregate in kelp beds 11 miles away, began to occupy the territory that the great whites had vacated. It looked like they found a new home. Seven gills get their name from the seven gill slits they have versus other sharks that typically have five. For over 18 years, researchers have been studying Seal Island and had never seen seven gills in their surveys. Now, this species of shark dominates this area of South Africa. Considered a living fossil, they have no other equal in the local food chain beside great white sharks and orcas. Because they closely resemble animals from the Jurassic period, it makes them easy to recognize from other sharks. After spending over 8,000 hours researching, local scientists recorded over 6,000 shark sightings. Growing up to 3 meters long, they feed on fish, seals, and even other sharks. But unfortunately, since 2009, more frequent sightings of killer whales in the area have resulted in several dead seven-gill sharks being found by scuba divers. Killer whales are not afraid of anything. Still, these studies show how the scales of equality move up and down in the animal world, even for big apex predators like sharks. New Smyrna Beach Known as the shark attack capital of the world, Florida reported in 2019 one-third of all shark attacks in the whole world. It is estimated that anyone who has swum in the waters off Florida has at some point been within 10 feet of a shark. One particular beach, New Smyrna Beach, had three attacks on the same day. While 53% of attacks that occur there tend to be surfers and those participating in board sports, 25% of the attacks occur to people who are swimming or just wading in the water. So why do so many shark attacks happen there? Could it simply be because sharks and humans interact often? In the past few years, it looks like shark attacks in Florida have actually been declining. It looks like sharks aren't going to the same places that they used to in the past. For example, one specific species, blacktip sharks, are found in those waters, but as the sharks change their migration patterns, results in shark attacks continue to decline slightly. New South Wales What is it that makes the waters of New South Wales such a breeding ground for dangerous sharks? Researchers believe that these opportunistic scavengers feed on dying or dead animals. Because surfers in wetsuits paddling on boards can be mistaken for sick or dead prey, curious sharks often give an exploratory bite to assess whether what they are seeing is actually food that they want to consume. Unfortunately, these exploratory bites aren't necessarily light, and they often remove substantial tissue and even limbs from those who are bitten. The fact that so many people flock to beaches in Australia, particularly in northern New South Wales, means that with more people in the water, there are more encounters between humans and sharks. By using wetsuits, people are able to extend their time in the water, making it much more tantalizing for sharks to spot them. Sharks are also known to follow bait fish that swim in shallow waters, where many beachgoers tend to stand and wade. So, while shark attacks have increased over the past two decades, it doesn't necessarily mean that there are more sharks in the water. 
Instead, more people visiting the beaches and a rise in the popularity of water-based fitness and recreational activities means that the predators are more likely to come into contact with surfers and swimmers. With its unspoiled beauty and natural habitats, a number of locations in Australia, including Erie Peninsula, Shark Bay, and Coral Reef, not only are shark sightings common, but they tend to bring tourists to the area, further highlighting unwanted run-ins with these predators of the deep. Lake Sharks 120 miles from the Caribbean Sea, Lake Cosibolca, known as Lake Nicaragua, is patrolled by a wide-ranging species of shark. Locals have been telling stories for years about dangerous, terrifying sharks that would even upset boats in the lake. A tour operator named Mariano Roblero said that you could see a dozen sharks in an hour. Lake Nicaragua has sharks that have adapted to freshwater life. But how did they get there? Biologist Thomas B. Thorson determined that bull sharks in search of food made their way into the lake through the San Juan River, which connects Lake Nicaragua with the Atlantic Ocean. It seems bull sharks have developed a way to lower the salt concentration of their blood when they inhabit fresh water, otherwise their internal system would make it difficult for them to survive. The Lake Nicaragua shark, as they are known, with its broad, flat snout and stocky shape is unpredictable and aggressive. Bull sharks can reach 10 feet in length and weigh up to 400 pounds. Other sea creatures in the lake include snook, tarpon, and sawfish, which reach weights of 1,000 pounds. While there used to be thousands and thousands of sharks in the lake, now it seems that they are disappearing due to overfishing. In any case, watch where you swim, because not even the lake is safe. Bull sharks swim where we swim, so it is more likely for us to get attacked by this kind of shark. Reunion Island just south of Mauritius in the Indian Ocean, Reunion Island is a popular location for surfers and scuba divers. However, the last four years have seen the idyllic paradise get a reputation for being one of the shark capitals of the world. In February 2017, the island unfortunately had its eighth fatal shark attack victim since 2011, when a bodyboarder was killed. But with only 19 attacks in a five-year span, although tragic, it makes one wonder why Reunion Island has such a reputation. As it turns out, the island's remote tropical location hosts favorable conditions for the apex predators, including bull and tiger sharks. In 2011, as urban expansion continued on the island, rainwater runoff became muddy, which is great for bull sharks on the prowl. When the island banned the fishing of sharks for food in 1999, natural shark populations flourished. So in 2013, when the island banned surfing and swimming everywhere except for in the island's lagoons, surfers still continued to flock to the area, ignoring the ban. Shark nets were deployed, but were not enough to stop another attack on a French tourist in 2016. While there were calls to cull sharks, the Reunion Island government feels that restoring the natural balance of the island's reefs, tackling overfishing, and establishing protected areas to encourage the return of harmless reef sharks might deter the more dangerous bull sharks from coming. The goal is to protect both people and sharks. Bondi Beach It makes sense that large, unspoiled beaches would be a breeding ground for sharks around the world. One of the most infamous is Australia's busiest beach, Bondi. While it is a sun, sand, and surf lover's utopia, the zone is not shark-free. After all, it is Australia. Shark sightings are not uncommon at the high-profile beach, and oftentimes surfers and bathers can't help themselves and swim out to see what's going on when sharks make themselves known. Stunning footage by Drone Shark app shows a video of five large gray nurse sharks swimming into a massive school of bait fish. What is even more stunning is the fact that surfers and swimmers headed out to see the spectacle more closely, not realizing that the nurse sharks were swimming right beneath them. Another time, a group of swimmers were having a training session where they were swimming from the shore to the shark net and taking pictures. When they finished and uploaded the images, they realized later that they'd come within a few feet of a huge shark. Large nets are deployed underwater to keep the sharks separate from swimmers. But as it turns out, the shark was on the beach side of the net instead. It doesn't matter whether you are a rookie or a fast swimmer when sharks are around. It brings into question whether shark nets work and continues to be a real problem when nature lovers want to get out and enjoy the water where such large predators lurk. What do you think of these nets? Let me know in the comments below. California's Red Triangle I know you've heard of the Bermuda Triangle, but you should actually be much more terrified of the Red Triangle in California. 
this is the easiest place to get attacked by a great white shark in the United States. Beginning around Bodega Bay and extending 50 miles west of San Francisco, the Triangle, which encompasses 200 miles of coastline, is home to 30% of all great white shark attacks. Researchers believe so many attacks occur here because of the number of elephant seals, harbor seals, sea lions, and sea otters that swim there. Naturally inquisitive, sharks are known to approach humans out of curiosity rather than hunger, but that doesn't make shark attacks any less dangerous. With some sharks spending up to eight months of the year living in the area with a dense population of marine mammals, attacks are bound to happen. In 1972, the Marine Mammal Act was also brought into play which ended the slaughter of seals. Soon after, marine biologists noticed shark populations increased in the area, leading to continued increases in sightings and attacks. Thanks for watching! Which place would you dare to visit? Or have you visited any of these places already? Did you see a shark? Let me know in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe if you haven't already, and I'll see you next time. Bye!